was a youth leader a long time ago, we had an event called RAC, Random Acts of Kindness. And we would load into cars and trucks armed with rakes and look for lawns full of leaves. Then we'd jump out and in five minutes we'd have the whole lawn raked, we'd dive back into our cars and go look for another lawn. Or in the winter we'd do the same with shovels and shovel people's driveways or, or uh, walkways, particularly seniors. One winter, it was a cold wintry day in Saskatchewan, we went downtown and gave out free hot chocolate. It was a blessing to be kind to others and it was a fun and good way to demonstrate to our young people what it meant to show kindness and goodness to others. The next qualities we're going to look at from the fruit of the Spirit are kindness and goodness. And I put them together because I think they go together so well. The world thinks of goodness as the quality of being morally good or virtuous. And it is to some extent. But the Bible is much more specific in its definition. Kelly Wise Valdez writes in a Christian publication in Florida, and she wrote this in an article about that very thing. Good actually means holy, pure, and righteousness. Literally, goodness is godliness. Goodness can, can often be seen in our actions, but our heart also has to be pure. The goodness of God has to be demonstrated in our lives every day. Psalm 23, 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God calls us to be filled with goodness from the inside out, being holy in what we do and what we say. Christians should have a heart that seeks goodness. We're not just to do good works, because doing good works without a good heart is empty. The goodness described as the fruit of the Spirit is not merely moral behavior, but an excellence of moral character. This goodness is only possible through God's grace and mercy. So, in reality, without experiencing the grace of God first and walking in obedience to him, we cannot even begin to truly demonstrate kindness to our, in our actions. But why should we be good? Because God is good and has been good to us. As his children were called to be like him in all that we do. I believe goodness is the motivating factor behind the quality of kindness. According to the dictionary, kindness is defined as a quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate. But kindness means so much more than that. Kindness is more than just being nice. In 1 Corinthians 13, God tells us that love is kind. Love is the basis of kindness. I wonder if there's a difference between the kindness the world shows others and the kindness we as Christians are to demonstrate to others. The fruit of the Spirit from the Spirit of God works in our hearts. It begins with the God's demonstration or model of love for us and is our response to that love. Goodness and kindness are attributes of God, qualities that are desirable but not consistently found in humans, Christians or otherwise. They're based in God's goodness towards us who were sinners, unlovely and enemies of God. Then that goodness flows from our hearts to the other, to others in the form of kindness. In Colossians 3 verse 12, we're told to imitate God, to put on like we put on our clothes, to put on a heart of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Our kindness is a response to the kindness of God that he has shown us in Romans 2, 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Titus 4, verses 3 to 6. For we also were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy and hateful, hating one another. But the kindness of, the, of God our Savior and his love for his mankind appeared. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Romans 11.22 says, Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness. This verse talks about 
ingrafting of the Gentiles into the chosen people of God. What a great and marvelous act of kindness God showed towards us in doing that. Romans 5, verse 6 and 8 say, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And it says, But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We see the same thing in Romans 2, 4, when the same Greek word is used again. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to do, toward repentance? Here we see that the kindness of God has communicated itself in all types of ways to sinners with the goal of them coming to repentance and salvation. Kindness should be born in my life as a byproduct of what God has done for me. The heart of the one who comes to Jesus for salvation expresses that goodness and kindness to others. The goodness and kindness shown to us gives us birth, gives birth to goodness and kindness that show, we show to others. And we express that in godly compassion for others. That includes even those we don't like. Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount, verse uh, chapter 6, verse 32 of Luke, If you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? For even sinners love those who love them. But love your enemies and do good. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Oh my, we're to love our enemies and do good to them. That's how we display that we are daughters of the Most High. Because he is kind and to the ungrateful and the wicked. And so are we. Remember, we once were enemies of God ourselves, ungrateful and wicked. As a born-again believer, we're commanded to be like Christ, like him. He is so kind, and we are to be kind. We are to do good and to actually love our enemies. Our ladies of the Bible study in our church are going through slowly the book of James, and in chapter 2, verse 15, it says clearly what our attitudes and actions towards others must be. It says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In other words, you can seem to have a sympathetic attitude towards someone, but for you to be truly kind to them, you need to take action. You need to be useful to them. In a sense, put hands and feet to your words of kindness, or they're just empty words. Someone once said, kindness is love's conduct. It's how love behaves itself. And I will ask, add, goodness is the attribute of God we must emulate in order to be kind in the way we ought to be. Let's take a moment now and look at a couple of women in the scriptures who showed both goodness and kindness. First, 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha and the Shunammite woman. Now there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunam, where there was a prominent woman, and she persuaded him to eat food, and so it was. As often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat food. She said to her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God passing by us continually. Please let us make a little walled upper chamber. And let us set a bed for him there, and a table, and a chair, and a lampstand. And it shall be when he comes to us that he can turn in there. <clears throat> there. Here was a woman who demonstrated the goodness of God. The goodness that God had shown to her by showing goodness to, her, to the prophet Elisha and his servant. She was not asked or by or pressured by him or anyone else to show that kindness. But the Lord led her, and she responded and invited Elisha home for meals and as he passed through and eventually made it possible for him to actually stay there whenever he needed. What a gracious act of kindness and love towards this very transient man of God. Take a moment now and think, how could that kind of compassion be demonstrated in my life? Is there someone who needs to be cared for or encouraged? Or possibly someone struggling in ministry or missions? I'm not saying we allow people to come in and use our hospitality in wrong ways or for false reasons, but think with me. Is your home open? Is it open to those who are in need? Is there someone who needs shelter or a meal that you could possibly help provide? 
God rewarded her kindness to his servant by opening her womb and giving her a son. It doesn't always happen that our kindness is rewarded in such a physical way like this, but we will always rejoice. A joyful heart and growth in our spiritual walk are the results of being kind. It is evident that as the story goes on that she grew in her faith as well. Sometime later, her son was out in the field working with his dad and he collapsed. The father brought the son into the, his wife and um, the story goes that instead of wailing in deep grief as he died in her arms, the Shunammite woman took him and laid his body on the bed of the prophet. So great was her faith. She didn't prepare him for, dip, for burial, but was preparing him to be healed. She then made arrangements to go immediately to see the prophet. When she approached or was approached by her husband and he asked her why she was going, she said, it's all right, it's well. He saddled her donkey and off she went. She knew that the prophet of God was the only one who could bring the healing of God to her son and she hurried off to find him. When Elisha saw her approaching, he sent his servant Gehazi to see what was going on and to greet her. God hadn't yet told him what the situation was. He asked, the Gehazi asked her if everything was all right. And again, she answered in the same way, everything is fine, it is well. But she kept going towards the prophet. She was a woman on a mission and she knew what she needed and who could do it for her. She was gonna to go to the top man. First Kings chapter four tells us, now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi went, came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone. For my, her soul is in deep distress and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? It seemed that that was all that was needed. Elisha knew what had happened. And he sent Gehazi on ahead with special instructions. At her urging, she and Elisha uh, followed soon after. I'll leave, let, leave you to read the story for yourself for the other details. But God used Elisha to bring that lad back to life that day. Because of the great faith of this woman who had shown great kindness to his prophet. What a marvelous blessing God gave to this woman. And it all began with her act of kindness. God calls us to display goodness and kindness to all and doesn't promise a tangible reward except that of the joy that comes from serving our master. And that should be enough. I think of that old chorus, there is joy in serving Jesus as I journey on my way, joy that fills my heart with praises every hour and every day. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus, joy that throbs within my heart Every moment, every hour, as I draw upon his power, there is joy, joy, joy that never shall depart. Now let's take a quick look at a second woman. Her name is Priscilla. In the year 52 AD, the Roman Empire, Claudius, issued an edict expelling all the Jews from the city of Rome. Seems from what some Roman historians say that they were causing considerable disturbance in the city. Claudius cared little about what was happening and the reason for it and even less about who was guilty. But he knew they were Jews and that was enough. So all the Jews were uprooted from their homes and banished from Rome, the innocent along with the guilty. That was when a Jew named Aquila, who had migrated to Rome from the province of Pontus on the Black Sea, packed his belongings, bid farewell to all his friends, embarked for the city of Corinth. By his side was his faithful wife. Priscilla. We do not know for certain whether she was a Jew or whether she was Roman born, nor are we sure whether they were both Christians at the time. But one thing we do know, they were together. In fact, they were always together. One name is never occurs in the scriptures apart from the other. They made their living together. They were tent makers working at their trade side by side. So when they arrived in Corinth, they proceeded to set up their tent making business. The timing was obviously of God, for no sooner had they gotten settled down in their shop than Paul, another tent maker, arrived in town from a fresh, fresh from an evangelistic crusade in Athens. Whenever Paul arrived in towns, he would first go to the synagogue and preach there and share the gospel. 
that usually didn't turn out really well. So then he would turn to the Gentiles and share Christ with them. Paul usually did not depend on new converts to support him. Neither did he have a mission agency that would send him funds to live on. So he would look for a place to set up his skill of tent making and begin to support himself while he shared Christ. This would also give him ample opportunities to meet the people around him, the everyday people of the community he was ministering in. Eventually, he made contact with Priscilla and Aquila, and Scripture tells us the story like this. After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, named a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working for, by trade, they were tent makers. It seems they connected instantly and had a deep, lasting friendship that was born. Paul came to work with them in their shop and even lived with them in their home during the time he stayed in Corinth. We don't know if they already knew Christ before they met Paul, but we can be assured that they met him, met Christ after. They likely grew greatly in their faith under his teaching and influence. God blessed their ministry. In Corinth, and even the chief ruler of the synagogue came to know Christ. Acts 18:11 says Paul settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. That would be a year and a half of intensive Bible study under one of the greatest preachers and teachers in history. How Aquila and Priscilla must have grown! When Paul left Corinth for Ephesus, they accompanied him, and he left them there when he embarked for his home church in Antioch. This move was providential, for Paul was gone, well, while he was gone in, in Acts 18, verse 24 and 26, it tells us a certain Jew named Apollos, who's Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and been fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching and accurately speaking of the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted, though, only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Well, Priscilla and Aquila went to hear him, and they were deeply impressed by his sincerity, his love for God, his knowledge for the Old Testament scriptures, and his brilliant oratorical ability. He could be mightily used in the service of Jesus Christ, they thought. But his message was deficient. All he knew beyond the Old Testament was the message of John the Baptist, merely looking forward to Messiah. So verse 26 tells us that when they heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They taught him about the coming of the Lord Jesus and his ministry on earth and his sacrificial and substitutionary death on the cross, his rising from the dead, death victorious and ascension into heaven, and the necessity for personal salvation from sin. All because one woman and her husband showed goodness and kindness to an itinerant preacher, Paul. They showed him hospitality and more, much more, for over a year. And then seeing the spiritual need in another young man's life, they answered God's call to share with him. These two people knew the goodness of God in their own hearts and shared it through kindness to Paul and many others. In Romans 16, Paul asks them to greet Pris Prisca and Aquila and mentions how invaluable they were to the growth of the early church, as well as mentioning the church in their own home. This amazing, committed, kind couple stand as a wonderful example of what a little kindness spurred on by the goodness of God can do in our lives. In 2 Timothy 4.19, Paul mentions them again. It was just a brief, simple greeting. Paul wanted to be remembered to them, especially in the last hours of his life. There must have been a deep bond between them, dear friends as laborers together in the kingdom of God. It's interesting that in an era when women were only to work in the background and kind of almost as non-persons, Prisca, is, uh, as she's called by Paul, acted and served God alongside her husband the, and the Apostle Paul as a truly liberated woman. For there's no freedom that brings more joy and satisfaction than the freedom of knowing and serving God and obeying his word. In most of these references to the incredible couple, Priscilla's name is mentioned first. That's uncommon in the culture of those days. Scholars believe she apparently took the initiative 
in the work they did for the Lord. Although she and her husband did work closely together, she have maybe it would have had a more prominent role. Needless to say, they made a great team and impacted many for Christ, both individually and together. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? I trust, my friends, that you know the joy that knowing and serving the Lord with your whole heart brings to your life, being born again through your repentance of sin and turning to the Lord. Then by serving him with your whole life, in whatever way he calls you to serve, all we have is God's, and we need to hold it with open hands and willing hearts for him to use each day with goodness and love and kindness, just like these female heroes of the scriptures did. Let's determine today to obey the Lord, just as these women did, demonstrating the fruit of goodness and kindness in our lives daily. And let's say together, are you ready? When I grow up, I want to be like her. See you later, ladies. <music>